Come, you sinners, poor and needy, weak and wounded, sick and sore. But Jesus, ready, stands to save you, the full of pity. and ruin by the fall and if you tarry until you're better you will never come at all I will rise and go to Jesus he will embrace me in his arms There are ten thousand shots, and I will arise. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning in thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been now forever. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above. Join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy.
Good morning, Springs. It's great to see you all this morning. Let's stand and read this call to worship together. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Isaiah 6, 1 through 8 reads, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two, they covered their faces, and with two, they covered their feet, and with two, they flew. And one called to another and said, 
Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the thresholds shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed, and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. Good morning. So did you ever think we'd be back here today with every row and I could see all your smiling faces because not everybody's having to wear a mask. Praise the Lord. So thank you. Thank you for your understanding this last year. It's, I know it's been hard and I know that many times you kind of wondered, what is Keith thinking? What's the safety team doing? But I'll tell you, the, the elders the staff, the delegates, we met many times, we talked a lot, we prayed a lot, then we prayed a little bit more to try to come up with the best ways to keep everybody safe. But really, the way we came through this season was because of you, for your understanding, for your willingness to think about others first, and just for your, for your grace. So thank you very much, church family, for that. So as we come back together, and there's more of us here at more frequent intervals and we do more fun stuff together you're going to see the safety team again but to do all the things that we try to do to keep everybody safe and just generally keep an eye on stuff uh i need some help so this is a shameless plug for volunteers so if you have a background in first aid or if you want to learn first aid and cpr and how to use an aed and hang out with some really cool people Please come see me or, and I'm going to ask these guys to stand up. Sorry, I didn't tell you all I was going to do this. Uh, the other members of the safety team would love to talk to you. So Ryan Stevenson, Kelly Moore, I think Blake, I don't know if Blake's here. I thought I saw him. And then uh, Roger Dreyer, I don't know if Roger's here today either. Oh, there's Roger. Anyway, this is the safety team. First off, thank you guys very much for all your help. So anyway, if you'd like to join us, we would love to have you. But from the bottom of our hearts, thank you for all you've done this last year to help everybody here and look at where we are now, all back together, safe, here to worship God. So if you'll pray with me. Dear Lord, thank you for the many blessings that you give us, especially the leaders of this church. Be with them as we continue to look for ways to keep everyone safe. And as we come through these scary and stressful times, Lord, thank you for the people of this church, their kindness, their love for each other. God, thank you for the many people who volunteer to serve in this and many other ministries to help this church and your kingdom grow and to reach others. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand and continue to worship.
we continue worshiping, please read this confession with me. Lord, our God, in our sin, we have avoided your call. Our love for you is like a morning cloud, like the dew that goes away early. Have mercy on us, deliver us from judgment, bind up our wounds and revive us. In Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. May Almighty God, who sent his Son into the world to save sinners, bring us his pardon and peace now and forever. Amen.
I just love how we can praise you and pray in song. I love that we can come to you and that we can just talk to you. I love that we can praise you in the things that we do and in every part of us because you have made us so intricately and you, the details um, that you just, and the gifts that you give us, we can praise you in every way that we get those gifts and you are so, so good to us. God, we offer this to you. We offer our prayer and our song to you. And we thank you so much that you offer this table to us. Thank you for your son. In Jesus' name, amen. You are welcome to actually come to the tables this morning. And the elders will be around if you want to have prayer. So come to the tables.
Let's stand and continue worshiping. Give us your heart for the nations. Let us be light to the world. Use us to declare your salvation to the people of the earth. May we be moved by compassion. Let us know your love for the lost. Jesus, use us to lead them to the cross. Father, Let us be light to the world. Use us to declare your salvation to the people of the earth. May we be moved by compassion. Let us know your love for the lost. Jesus, use us to lead them to the Send us forth to lead them to the cross. Spirit, here we are. Fill us with your power. Send us forth to lead them to the cross. Father, here we are. Standing in your presence, send us forth to lead them to the cross. Spirit, here we are. Fill us with your power. Send us forth to lead them to the cross.
nothing is impossible. Every chain is breakable with you. We are victorious. You are stronger than our hearts. You are greater than the dark with you. We are victorious. We are more than conquerors through Christ. You have overcome this world, this life. We will not bow to sin or to shame. We are defiant in your name. You are the fire that cannot be tamed. You are the power in our veins, my Lord. Our God, our conqueror. This morning, we want to acknowledge the Tulsa Race Massacre. You may know something about the Tulsa Race Massacre. So from May 31st through June 1st in 1921, a mob of white men entered the Greenwood District in Tulsa, which was also known as the Black Wall Street. They murdered approximately 300 black people. There was an incredible amount of violence. They even used a private airplane to fly over the Greenwood District, dropping bombs that killed people, destroyed property, leaving nearly 10,000 people homeless, and caused an immense amount of suffering. Tomorrow, May 31st through June 1st, marks the 100-year anniversary of this event, which has largely been forgotten. As we acknowledge this event this morning, we do so from a deep sense of empathy for our brothers and sisters who are affected by this event and continue to experience the reality and pain of what this event represents. Our vision at the Springs is this, that we are being transformed into the image of Christ so that many will find their way back to God. And one of the ways we become the image of Jesus is when we are present with people who are hurting. So this morning, we are sharing a video interview uh, that I did recently with our friend Gary Jones. Gary is the Assistant Dean of Students and the Chair of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee at Oklahoma Christian University. Gary also serves as a minister at the Eastside Church of Christ on 36th and Prospect in Oklahoma City. So as you'll see in this video, Gary shares why acknowledging this event is important and what this event means to our brothers and sisters in Christ. So in 1921, from May 31st to June 1st, mm -hmm. a mob of white men entered the Greenwood, the Greenwood District in Tulsa, which is also known as the Black Wall Street. They murdered black people, an incredible amount of violence. Property was destroyed. They even used a private airplane to fly over that district and drop bombs, killing people, destroying property, causing an immense amount of suffering. So as we come upon the 100 year anniversary of what has become known as the Tulsa Race Massacre, what does this event mean to you and to the community that you serve? That's a great question. I think that it, it means a lot, and, and I'm not quite sure it can be put into words adequately. Uh, you mentioned the, the, the powerful uh, visual, even for us mentally, of a plane, right, dropping bombs on, on our own citizens. Interestingly enough, that only happens twice in our country's history. It's in Tulsa and in Philadelphia, both in, in race riots. Um, but it means a lot to us because of, I think, the current situation that we find ourselves in. Black Wall Street represented black wealth, black generational wealth. It represented black excellence. And the, dis the destruction of, of Greenwood was not just 
Uh, we were mad at, at, at black people for this, this incident that allegedly happened, but it was to destroy a system, right? It was to destroy uh, these, these, these people that had gotten out of control. They, they, they were self-contained, and so uh, it's a, it's a two-sided coin. One side of the coin is it represents uh, acknowledgement, right, of, of what took place. Uh, we know that we don't have a great track record of doing that. We can look at the Tuskegee syphilis experiment and see that. But the other side of that coin is it represents some hope for us. It represents uh, what could become. Uh, we have no model of, of generational wealth amongst our community. If you look at the, the Michael Jordans and the Oprah Winfrey's, they all came from poor beginnings. And so to understand that it is possible for us in this country, it's a balance. It's a balance of, 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 of anger uh, and, and, and despair, but also of hope and uh, what Du Bois calls the double consciousness of what could become. For people that don't know much about the, the Tulsa race massacre, often hear them ask the question, uh, why, why does this matter? Why are we talking about this? Why does, it, why does it matter to me? So for someone that doesn't attend a church like Esau, mm -hmm. why is this important? Yeah, it's, it's really important. I, I think I can make the argument, Ben, it should be even more important to you. Uh, I believe wholeheartedly the systems don't change until those who benefit from systems make the decision that the benefit that they derive from the system isn't as important as changing the system, right? And so it should, I, I think it's even more important to you because at some point I need you to understand that when it means something to you, life changes for me. I know this is overly simplistic, but it's, it's probably the best way to describe it. Slavery doesn't end because black people got tired of working. Right? A white guy said to another white guy, listen, this is wrong, and I'll fight you over it. Now, the, the, the motives probably are a little you know, debatable, but someone who benefited from the system decided to change it. And so this is really important, and I think it should be important to us as people of faith because we, we have to stop looking at it as the Tulsa race massacre or as the Tuskegee syphilis experiment or as George Floyd and Trayvon Martin. We need to start seeing people hearts and souls and when you start to see me as a person you start to value me and this is what we're starting to see uh, happening how can we be better than the church of 1921 in other words mm -hmm. what's our role what's our responsibility how can we do better uh, today than the church of 1921 i think i think this is a start i think this conversation is a start I think acknowledgement uh, is, is first and foremost, but we have to understand that acknowledgement brings about accountability. When I know about it, I've got to do something about it. And I think it starts with acknowledgement, having these conversations, um, not taking the, the, the position that if we don't talk about it, it'll go away. I'll tell you, I'm 38 years old. I've been, I've been black all my life, believe it or not. And the conversation doesn't go away just because you don't want to have it with me. Uh, my, my heart still races uh, when the red and blue lights pull up behind me or when I'm in the store and a woman clutches her purse as I walk by. Uh, and so conversation, I think, is first and foremost. But secondly, it's acknowledging that there is a place for the church uh, to be out front, uh, to be outspoken. I don't think we can preach a gospel of being here for the least, the last, the lost, uh, and not being in, be involved in the conversation of race and culture and diversity uh, in this country. I want to thank our friend Gary Jones for being willing to, uh, to share what the 100-year anniversary of the Tulsa Race and Massacre means to him and to the community that he serves. There's an extended video. It's about 11 minutes long. If you want to watch that video, you can find it. It's going to be on our website. You can also find it on some of our, our social media pages here at the Springs. Let's pray. God, your amazing grace is what saves us. Your love for us is unfathomable. For you empathize with us. You suffer with us. You die for us. As your church, as your disciples, may we be a people that empathize with those that are hurting that suffer with those that suffer and that are willing to give our lives for the sake 
of others. For that is your beautiful way in the world. And we thank you for your amazing grace that has shown us the way. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Well, I want to welcome everybody to the Springs. For those of you that are members, welcome. For those of you that are visitors, we are very happy that you have joined us today. For those of you that are online, welcome. Our vision here at the Springs is to be transformed into the image of Christ so that many will find their way to God. And we do this through three different ways. We gather together in the name of the Father like we do this morning. And we're going to grow. We hope to grow into the image of his son and be transformed into his image. And to go by the power of his Holy Spirit. And this year we are focusing on the word grow. We are focusing how we can grow and be transformed into the image of Christ. So, beginning next week, our sermon series for the month of June and July, we're going to have guest speakers come and, and give us a message on a sermon series called Practices of Love, Spiritual Disciplines for the Life of the World. And so, next week, Ryan Jones is going to be uh, deliver, delivering our message. We'll also have Charles Ricks and Paul Whitmire. We'll have Jackie Halstead from Lipscomb University and Leah Redling will also uh, share a word and uh, proclaim God's mes message to us. So we hope you join us this summer. We know summers are, are, are a mix of, of travel as we're getting back out, but we're hoping that you can join and begin not only hearing about spiritual disciplines, but actually start practicing them. For discipleship is not just an idea, it is a way of life. It is something that we practice. So we're excited about that sermon series. But today, we're going to finish up with our series in the Gospel of Mark, following Jesus. And so, if you want to open your phone, or your Bible, or if you just want to look up on the screen, we'll be reading from Mark chapter 16, 1 through 8. The word of the Lord says this. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they, may go, they, uh, they might go and anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the next day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked one another, who will roll away in the stone from the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus of Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? But go, tell his disciples and people. There you will see him, just as you were told. And trembling and bewildered. The women went out and they fled the tomb. And they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. The ending of the Gospel of Mark, it's just weird. There's no other way to cut it. It's just odd because the earliest mans manuscripts of Mark ends, the earliest copies of Mark that we have actually end here in chapter 8. It ends this way. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. I mean, something is just not right about that. At least that's what later uh, people that transcribed the Gospels thought. They said something's not right. Something's missing. It's almost like did something get torn off on the last piece of the scroll? What happened? It's abrupt. It just ends. It's mysterious. What happened? It's confusing. Something is missing. And so someone later thought, we need to fix this. There are some of us in this room that can't quite... I, I got to finish this. It's got to be finished. 
So we're not going to read it, but you get this other ending, which many of your Bibles say, hey, the, the, the earliest manuscript, manuscripts don't have this later writing. But then if you go to the, the later writing, it kind of gets even weirder. Not all of it. But it talks about seeing Jesus and not believing, which is not that weird. But you find that in the Gospel of John. You also find uh, another version of uh, the Great Commission, which you find more appropriately in Matthew. But then you get stuff like this. And they will handle snakes. Those who are disciples will handle snakes and drink poison. And you're like, what? Drink poison? And to be fair, Paul handles a snake and acts and is bitten. There's no mention of poison, drinking poison in the rest of the Bible. It just gets kind of weird. And so many scholars, and I'm not a scholar, but including myself, I think that Mark chapter 8 is actually where the original gospel ended. Now, don't let that get you all in a, 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 a worried and confused you can find almost everything in the, the, from 9 all the way to the end in other parts and other gospels and other texts. But here's why I think it actually ends in verse 8. Because if you read the entire gospel, chapter 16, 1 through 8, actually fits with Mark. Let me give you an example. So... Mark 16, 1 through 8 ends abruptly. I mean, they said nothing to anyone because they're afraid. The end. Guess what? The beginning of Mark's gospel starts very abruptly. It starts with the introduction. This is the gospel of Jesus, the Son of God, right? And then it goes right into talking about John the Baptist. It skips over the birth narrative. There's no birth narrative there. There's no preparation. It just goes introduction Boom, right into ministry. And in fact, most of the stories in the Gospel of Mark don't have nice, clean transitions. It's just boom, one story to the next. Abrupt, abrupt, abrupt. So that it finishes abruptly kind of matches the way Mark tells the story. It's also a mysterious ending. I mean, this fits also because Jesus is a very mysterious Messiah, in the Gospel of Mark. There's always this messianic secret that happens in the Gospel of Mark. When the demons actually say, we know who you are. You're the Son of God. He tells them, shh, be quiet. And then when he goes and he heals people, he says, when you go back to town, don't, don't tell anybody. But what's ironic about Mark chapter 16, 1 through 8 is that the whole gospel, Jesus has been telling demons and people, shh, be quiet, don't say anything. And then we get to the end of the gospel, and there's an angel that says, go tell the disciples and Peter, go tell them this. He's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told. And what's ironic in this reversal of events is that they're told to say something and they say nothing. Not a word. There's also confusion about this ending. But it matches Mark's gospel because if you're paying attention at all in the gospel of Mark, everybody and I mean everybody, is confused. There is confusion up and down. They're bewildered. They're confused. They're astonished. They're amazed. All these words come up. Last week, I talked about the movie The Sixth Sense. I hope I don't have to give the, the, uh, the warning again, right? Uh, a spoiler alert. And I'm not going to apologize because it's a 20-year-old movie, and if you haven't seen it, you should be apologizing to me because it's about time that you've seen this movie, right? But do you remember the first time you watched The Sixth Sense? 
And at the end, this secret was revealed. Honest. How many of you, after you watched it the first time and had this aha moment, how many of you went back and watched it again? Raise your hand. Oh, you are lying. All of you are lying. You know you went back. The Gospel of Mark kind of works like that. Once Jesus' identity is revealed at the end, just like in the sixth sense, you want to go back and say, how did I miss this? How did I not realize the guy was dead the whole time? How did I not understand who Jesus was? You want to go back to see all the clues along the way and say to yourself, how did I miss this? How did I miss that salvation is a way of life? If you go back right off the bat, it's been about a way the whole time. So in Mark chapter 1, 1 through 3, it says the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, Son of God, which is an important title for Mark. Because the only human being in the entire gospel to claim him Son of God is the centurion when he sees how he dies. Revelation, this man, this is the Son of God. This is what, this, this is what it means to be Son of God, to, to suffer and to die. In verse 2 it says, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of the one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his path. From the very beginning, Mark wants to give you a clue as to Jesus' identity as the Son of God. But Jesus' identity as Son of God has a specific meaning. And so right away, he gives us a clue that Jesus' identity has to do with a way, a particular way. A particular way of living in the world. And we think, ah, oh, of course, this is about a way of life. How did I not see that? Well, Mark also is interested in what you see. We talked about this in Mark chapter 10, verse 52. It's the healing of the blind man. And he comes to Jesus and says, Rabbi, I want to see. And Jesus says, go. Your faith has healed you. And it says, immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the way. Just like in the sixth sense, there are clues throughout the entire gospel of Mark. And once the ending is revealed, you go, oh, I got to go back. What is he saying? How did I miss this? How could I not see this? It's interesting also that the blind man, what does he do when he receives his sight? He follows. And he follows Jesus along the way. But you could still say, I'm still confused. Where's the resurrected Christ, Mark? Because if you end in verse 8, you never see the resurrected Christ. That's pretty odd for a gospel, right? You never see Jesus resurrected. You hear the angel says he's resurrected. But Mark, I don't see him. But I think the ending begs the question, right? It's this abrupt ending about this mysterious Messiah who's been revealed now. And the confusion now kind of slowly and the fog clears away and we can begin to see. And that he doesn't show you the resurrected Christ. Because what he's saying in the ending is that you can see the resurrected Christ when you participate in his way of salvation. That's when you can see him. 
You can see him when you imitate his way of life. That's when you'll see the resurrection. You experience his resurrection when you follow Jesus along the way. Several weeks ago, Brett uh, talked about the documentary Free Solo. I don't know if you've seen this documentary. It's a documentary of this uh, rock climber uh, that attempts to climb El Capitan in um, is it Yosemite in California. And he climbs it without any ropes. Free solo. There's nothing to catch him. There's no harness that if he falls off the rock, he climbs this, this rock face. And you could see from this picture, they even talk about, they even talk about in the, the documentary, they thought they might witness someone, this man, fall to his death. And they are going to be recording this. Brett said this, I thought it was brilliant. The discipleship is kind of like free solo. Discipleship means you got to put some skin in the game. Following Jesus is a risky proposition. There are risks to it. Risks very worth taking, but risks nonetheless. And the call of Jesus is for you to put some skin in the game. To get on the wall without any of those safety nets, without any of those assurances, and follow Jesus because he got on the wall without any of those safety nets, without any of those assurances. Salvation requires some skin in the game. And I want you to resist the temptation right now to think about the debate, the debate uh, over salvation and works here. Because Mark is not interested in that debate. He's just not. For Mark, salvation is not something you earn. Salvation is a way of life. And he's trying to get you to see that. It is a revelation, a gift that demands something from you. So when we get to the end of Mark 16, 7 through 8, it says, but go tell the disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Mark is about identity. It's the question, who do you say he is? Mark is about discipleship because who you say he is will determine how you follow. So they, the angel says this. He says, go say something about Jesus. He is going ahead of you and he wants you to follow him there in order that you might see him. And it says, they said nothing because they were afraid. And the book ends with fear. Fear is a huge theme in the gospel of Mark. People are afraid. People are afraid of Jesus. They don't understand who he is. You remember the demons? The demons are always afraid of Jesus. And they know exactly who he is. And I've said resist the temptation in Mark to think, well, of course the demons are afraid of Jesus. They don't want to follow because that's what demons do. No. What do the demons know that the people don't that make them afraid? Jesus has asked us, who do you say that I am? Because who you say I am will determine how you follow. And Jesus over and over and over again, he tells the disciples and he tells us, 
that he is the one who will suffer and die and rise on the third day. This is who Jesus is. This is his way. Servanthood, self-denial, humility, and taking up your cross and dying with Jesus every day. This is who he is, and this is who he calls you and I to be. He wants you and I to follow him in this way. Servanthood, self-denial, humility, and death. This is how God loves us, and he loves the world Therefore, it is how we love each other and love the world. It is the defining mark of what it means to be a disciple. It is the defining mark of what the kingdom of God really is. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German Christian that lived from 1904 to 1945. He was a prominent Christian leader during the rise of Adolf Hitler and Nazi, the Nazi party. You've heard me talk about Bonhoeffer before, but I think his story is compelling, and you'll see why. If you, if you don't remember, I want to remind you of this story, that he began resisting the Nazis in 1933, and he raised his voice against Hitler's persecution of the Jews. He insisted that the church should not just be a bandage, that it should not just bandage victims under the wheel, but it should actually jam the spoke of the wheel itself, the very thing that's causing hurt and suffering. So he began developing underground seminaries. But there was backlash by the Nazis. And at the urging of his friends, he fled to America in 1939, just before the war began, to teach at a seminary in New York City. Over time, he regretted that decision and was convicted that he could not be a part of, of the healing of the church if he did not suffer with it. And so against his friend's urging, he took the last transatlantic ship back to Germany as the war began. Now, from all we know about Bonhoeffer, he was a pacifist. He believed in the way of peace. But he decided to join this underground movement led by his brother-in-law to resist the Nazis and to assassinate Hitler. And so, he primarily worked to unite churches in order to heal the church after the war. But on April, in April 1943, Bonhoeffer was arrested. And he spent two years in prison, in a Nazi prison. And in 1937, he wrote a book, The Cost of Discipleship, which is now a classic. And in this, he says this in his book. He says, the cross is laid on every Christian. The first Christ suffering which every person must experience is the call to abandon the attachments of this world. That is self-denial. It is that dying of the old person which is the result of his or her encounter with Christ. As we embark upon discipleship, we surrender ourselves to Christ in union with with his death, we give over our lives to death. Thus, it begins. The cross is not the terrible end to an otherwise God-fearing and happy life, but it meets us at the beginning of our communion with Christ. And then he says this. He says, when Christ calls a person, he bids us to come to die. On April 9th, 1945, just weeks before the end of the war, 
Bonhoeffer was marched out into the courtyard, stripped naked, and hung by his neck. And what rings from Bonhoeffer, what rings from his writings that he wrote in prison is this. Christ's call to discipleship is this. Come and die. This is Mark's call. This is Jesus' call through the gospel of Mark. Come and die. I tell you what, Mark would have made a terrible marketing person. Because the church and the gospel of Mark, you know what they have on their kiosk and on their homepage? Come die with us. But how does church growth happen? Nobody's going to come. And Mark says, Jesus calls this. Come die with us. Because if you want to save your life, you'll lose it. But if you lose your life for the gospel, you'll actually save it. There is something redemptive about this way of Jesus. There's something redemptive about servanthood and self-denial and death. There's something redemptive about the suffering with Christ for the sake of others. Martin Luther King Jr. understood this about his own suffering. He said this. He says, I have attempted to see my personal ordeals, my own suffering, as an opportunity to transform myself and heal the people involved in the tragic situation which now obtains. I've lived these last few years with the conviction that unearned suffering is redemptive. The call of Jesus, the call to salvation... The call to discipleship is clear. Servanthood, self-denial, and dying with Jesus. So the question to us as we finish the gospel of Mark is this. Will you follow? Will you be afraid? Will you follow and serve everyone around you? Will you serve your friends and your family? Will you serve the least, the last, and the lost? Will you serve your enemies? Will you be afraid? Will you follow and deny yourself? Will you die to what you want for the sake of others, for the life of others? Will you be afraid? Will you follow Jesus and die with him? Will you die daily to yourself? Will you die to your selfish ambitions, your pride, the sin in your life? Will you be afraid? Will you follow by empathizing with our brothers and sisters who are hurting? Will you suffer with them and for them in order to transform yourself and to heal the people involved in the tragic situation which now obtains? The question for us is, will you follow? And will you be afraid? Let's stand and sing together. See from his head his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow below down. Did such love and sorrow 
God is good. And by his amazing grace, he has revealed the mystery of his salvation through Jesus and his way of life. So the challenge for us is this, will we follow? Will we follow him into servanthood? Will we follow him into self-denial? Will we follow him into death, taking up our cross and dying with him so that the world may live? This is the way of salvation, not only for you and for I, but for the entire world. Praise be to God. May the amazing grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the unfathomable love of God our Father and the intimate fellowship of God's Holy Spirit be with you now and this week and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace.